teaching. I'm sorry, I'm here. So you'll have to settle. Good morning. How's everybody? You should love it when you buy a new Bible and it starts falling apart automatically right when you get it. Uh. <laughs> well, you know, I got this picture on my iPad here. It says a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. So, All right. Let's see what we got here. waiting for our technology to catch up. Okay. The Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. All Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. We need to be diligent to present yourselves approved to God as workmen uh, who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Approve yourselves doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. And finally, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere heart. Faith. Interesting that that uh, comes up this morning because that uh, really points us to what Paul is going to be dealing with in his in this passage this morning. If you know anything about the life of Paul, uh, when you go to the book of Acts and look at what Paul went through and coming down towards the end of his ministry, um, he was on his way to Jerusalem, and time after time. People would, uh, as a matter of fact, I think it was Agabus, the prophet, took Paul's belt and bound his hands and feet and said, this is what's going to happen to the man to whom this belt belongs if he goes to Jerusalem. Paul was determined to go. And so despite the, the many, many warnings that he received on the way there, um, Paul was determined. He said, I'm ready to be poured out as a drink offering. He was ready to die for the Lord Jesus Christ. And after Looking at what Paul had to go through in First and Second Corinthians, I can see why he was ready. He he had to deal with a lot of mess and and uh, with churches that he had poured himself into, uh, but who had turned on him at, at times. Of course, there were others that were faithful and and, and followed his teaching, and and uh, even when they had problems they listen to Paul and follow but but this in particular is church in Corinth man it was a it it caused him a lot of heartache and so I can see why Paul Paul was at the end of his life and he's thinking you know I'm ready to go and uh, I, I can't say that it was because of these types of issues I think he was just ready to meet his savior but I'm sure these played played a role but anyway we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to begin reading in verse 12. So read with me if you will. For our proud confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially toward you. For we write nothing else to you than what you read and understand. And I hope you will understand until the end, just as you also partially did understand us, that we are your reason to be proud as you, are, uh, as you also are ours in the day of our Lord Jesus. In this confidence, I intended at first to come to you so that you might twice receive a blessing, that is, to pass your way into Macedonia and again from Macedonia to come to you and by you to be helped on my journey to Judea. Therefore, I was not vacillating when I intended to do this, was I? Or what, uh, what I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh so that with me there will be yes, yes, and no, no at the same time? But as God is faithful, our word to you is yes and no. For the reason, for the, for the Son of God, Christ Jesus, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, 
but is yes in him. For as many as are the promises of God in him, they are yes. Therefore also through him is our amen to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God, who also sealed us and gave us the spirit in our hearts as a pledge. Father, thank you for your word and pray that you would help us to understand it correctly, handle it correctly this morning, and uh, see how we need to... uh, adjust our lives to live in accordance with what we find here today. In Jesus' name, amen. I think I misread part of that. Um, Yeah, in verse 18, but as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. Now, after we've read through all of this, how many of you just automatically understood all that? Yeah. Okay, well, let's go home. All right. Goodness gracious. But I actually started getting a grasp of what John, John, Bill, Henry, whoever wrote this, Paul, was trying to say uh, in this. But it's very difficult, as you can see. And the Greek really doesn't help clarify anything. As a matter of fact, it's a little bit more difficult to understand. Um, So here's where we are. We're still in point one, consolation, uh, comfort in his ministry or comfort in ministry. And today we're looking at the conduct conduct. Of Paul. Now, uh, I'll probably allude to it or go back to it at some point uh, this morning, but back in chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians, you remember Paul gave a, a plan. This, his plan was to uh, go through Macedonia uh, and then come to Corinth. That was his original plan. He wanted to spend time or spend the entire winter with them uh, and then have them be able to help him go to Judea. But things happened, uh, and Paul's plans were forced to change. Um, uh, it's like uh, David said when he was up there, up here this morning. You know, uh, we've been a little flexible with our plans this summer. We've had to. We had some things that have come up that we've had to change something here or there. And uh, and hopefully none of y'all look at us and say, "Well, you guys are duplicitous. You are. You say one thing and then you do something else." And surely y'all don't say that. If you do, uh, don't. Um, but this is what Paul's dealing with. Paul made plans. He had informed them of his plans, and then he, his plans changed. Uh, and we're going to get a little bit more into that as we, as we move along. But what Paul is trying to do here, he's defending his integrity. He's, he's defending his uh, apostolic authority. He's defending the honesty and sincerity of his ministry towards them. And uh, he's got to point out a few things about both himself Uh, and his fellow companions, Silvanus and Timothy, and he does so on the basis of the character of God himself. But anyway, we'll get into all of this as we walk through. So we're looking at Paul defending his conduct, and the first thing that we find this morning is Paul explaining his change in travel plans. That's what we find all the way through chapter 2 and verse 4. So you can see we're going to be dealing with with this a couple weeks Um, And so Paul says, first of all, for our proud confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially toward you. So the first thing Paul is pointing out here is the basis for his confidence. The word confidence there is his, it uh, it really means confidence. boasting or the reason for boasting. What Paul had, he's saying here, that he and uh, Sylvanus and Timothy had a reason to boast. And uh, that reason for boasting, he points to as the testimony of his conscience. The testimony of his conscience. And so he discusses what what was the testimony of, of Paul's conscience and Sylvanus and Timothy. How could they have a confidence or a reason for boasting because of their conscience? Well, uh, he points out that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in, well, let me back up a little bit because the main verb is, is we have conducted ourselves. So his conscience is clear as to the manner of their conduct, uh, not just in the world, he says, but towards them. Okay, and he describes that. First of all, he says that their conduct uh, 
was in holiness. The, the Greek word that is translated here as holiness, I, I, I don't like that translation because there's a, a different word for holiness and it's not this. Um, but what it means is simplicity or singleness of purpose. Now think of it for a moment. Um, Paul is being accused and as a matter of fact, in some of what he's written here, uh, as he moves, moves along, it seems like he may even have been quoting some of the things that were said about him. But Paul's being accused of, of saying one thing and doing another, or writing one thing and doing another. And so he says, no, I have a singleness of purpose. My conscience is clear. I have a singleness of purpose. I have a simplicity of of purpose. I have one goal in mind, he says. So that's part of the testimony of his conscience. Not that I'm saying one thing and doing another. And then he says also in godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom. That godly sincerity it means purity of motives. Purity of motives. Now some say that the a related word to this Greek word here maybe even its, its, uh, its sister word, I guess you might call it, uh, speaks of uh, the way that a potter in the ancient times would check to see if a jar that he had made or something like that was free from impurities. And so he would take it out into the sunlight and so that the sun would judge. In other words, he could hold the pot up and allow the sun to reveal to him the impurities or the cracks or anything like that that he might not have been able to see before. Now, uh, the uh, brown drivers, no, that's wrong. That's the Hebrew. Um, the BDAG, uh, uh, Bauer, Danker, Art, and Gingrich, that's fun to say. Uh, it's a Greek lexicon. They, they say that's a dubious translation. But regardless, what that sincerity or purity of motives means is that it wasn't mixed with anything else. It's, it's like uh, having a, a, a purity of, a, of an alloy or of, a, of an, a, a, an iron or gold or something that had been purified. There was nothing mixed in it. So Paul's not saying, look, I'm not saying one thing with, a, with an ulterior motive. He said, I had sincere godly motives or purity of motives. And then he says, uh, we didn't conduct ourselves in merely human wisdom. Now that should ring a bell with you, should it not? Didn't Paul spend a little bit of time in 1 Corinthians discussing the distinction or the contrast between godly wisdom and man's wisdom? And Paul is reminding them, look, when we came to you, we were not conducting ourselves by merely human wisdom. That's what he means by fleshly wisdom, wisdom merely human wisdom. Wisdom. Now we could go back to 1 Corinthians and look at the contrast, but I'm going to allow you to do that so we don't take up that time. But this is his defense. And then not only was it in holiness and godly sincerity, uh, not by human wisdom, but he had conducted himself. He and Silvanus and Timothy had conducted themselves by God's grace. In other words, their entire ministry, their entire life was conducted under the, the auspices are under the directing influence of God's grace. Paul saw everything in life through the lens of God's grace. And that's something that, that we need to be uh, attempting to do in our lives. We need to see everything in life uh, through the lens of God's grace. In other words, some people don't like the saying, uh, there but for the grace of God go I. When you look at someone who's down and out and who has some sort of issue that they brought upon themselves because of their sin. And we say, there before the grace of God go I, or, or maybe just whatever situation they're in. And some people have said, you know, that's just not the right thing to say because, because we're, we're saved by God's grace. And so we're above this, that, or the other. I don't know what their explanation is really. And I've thought about that and I've wrestled with that. I mean, it seems like a small thing to concern yourself with, but, but I've, as I've looked at it time and time again, I think that's, that's the way we have to look at uh, all of life uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, the, the world of sin and things like that and the, the difficulties and things that people find themselves in. Uh, there before the grace of God go I, because were it not for God's grace, uh, I could be uh, in the gutter somewhere. I could be homeless. I could, I could have this, that, or the other issue that I'm dealing with or that people deal with. Uh, and even in the midst of, of troubling circumstances, we can look at other people's issues and say, there before the grace of God go I. 
Because, you know, uh, you ever watch a comedy TV show and something's going wrong in, 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 of course, I know you are all holy. You don't watch television. Um, but something's going wrong in, in the life of somebody in the show. And they say, well, uh, just, well, at least things can't get any worse. And what does that normally mean? That's a signal, right? When you hear somebody in a comedy say something like that, right? You know that the next thing that happens is going to be something worse than what just happened. Well, because of God's grace, we can look at the, uh, even in our terrible issues or terrible circumstances we might find ourselves in, we can always think, you know, if it weren't for God's grace, it could be even worse, right? But even further, even deeper than that, if it weren't for God's grace sustaining me in this situation, where would I be, right? And the things that, that, that the, the, those type of things that uh, the unbelieving world cannot grasp, cannot take hold of, those are promises that we can hold on to God's grace even in the midst of difficult times. And that's what Paul is pointing to here, that his whole uh, conduct of life was directed in or by God's grace. So that when he ministered to the Corinthians, when he wrote to the Corinthians, when he sent Titus or Timothy to deliver messages to the Corinthians, it was all by God's grace and holiness and godly sincerity and not directed by human wisdom. And Paul goes on then and defines the consistency of his conduct. Now remember, we just looked at the testimony of his conscience dealing, explaining his conduct or characterizing his conduct. Now he discusses the consistency of his conduct in verses 13 and 14. He says this, for we write nothing else to you than what you read and understand. And I hope you will understand until the end. Now it, I read over this. I don't know how many times trying to understand. And some of you may read this and think, why is he having a hard time understanding it? And that's okay because I'm probably not as smart as you are. Okay, but I've read verse 13 over and over trying to take a to get a grasp of what is he saying here? What is, I don't understand for sure. But if we look at the character of his conduct that he expressed in verse 12, and then we look at verse 13. Now, that word for that Greek word, he, it's a signal that he's going to explain something that he just said. And so his conscience is clear based upon the character of his conduct because everything that he had written to them to that point, he said exactly what he meant to say. He wasn't writing one thing and planning something else. That's what he's being accused of, okay, because he had to change his travel plans. There was no graciousness or there's no grace exercised by some in the church of Corinth because of the fact that he had to change his plan. How many times did God change Paul's plans? You can go through the book of Acts and you can see there were times where Paul wanted to go here and he said, well, God would not allow me to. Well, Paul had planned to go there, but God would not allow him to do that. Things like that. So Paul was simply following the will of God and changed his travel plans for, for whatever reason. In particular, you remember in chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians, he said that he was first going to go to Macedonia and then to Corinth, right? You remember that. And we're going to get into that in just a little bit. But instead, things had gotten so bad in Corinth that he, did, he went, instead of going to Macedonia, he went directly from Ephesus to Corinth and then to Macedonia. And people thought, well, you said one thing and you said it and, and you did another. Matter of fact, he had to change his plans a couple of times. Well, anyway, so he's going to describe the consistency of his conduct here. And verse 13 uh, says that everything I wrote to you, I wrote straightforward and it was clear. I, did, I wasn't writing one thing and planning something else. Straightforward clarity in his writings. So he says that uh, I, I, we write nothing else to you than what you read. So you don't have to read between the lines and understand so what I've written to you is understandable to you unless you, if you notice nowadays, a lot of times people will not understand something you say or something someone else says. And many times, you know why? By choice. They don't want to understand it. They have a, an agenda. They have their own 
set of principles that they're going to adhere to. And if they, if they find it useful to misunderstand something you say, they use it against you, right? Well, same thing in Paul's day. So he says, um, uh, you, you read and you understand. Both of those are in the present tense. And he says, and I hope you will understand until the end. In other words, he hopes that they will continue to, to comprehend what Paul has been writing. And the question is to uh, answer, what does he mean by until the end? Does he mean by till the end of the letter? Or does he mean by, as uh, Dr. Um, Constable says, that it refers to the end of their lives? I don't know. It's not real clear. Probably, I would probably lean towards what Dr. Constable says, that, that Paul was wanting them to understand what he had written and taught them until the day they die. And the reason I would lean towards that is because of what he says in verse 14, where he says, just as you also partially did understand, okay, the word understand in verse 13 is the, is the word for a full comprehension or understanding with certainty, okay? Now in verse 14, uh, if you remember, this Greek word meros uh, was used back in chapter 14 of, of uh, 1 Corinthians where he spoke of the fact that, that at that t- moment in time, they only had partial knowledge, right? They only had knowledge in a part. Well, the same thing is going on here. Apparently, he's saying that some of what I said and some of what I wrote, you understood part of it, but I'm wanting you to come to a complete knowledge of what I've written and what I've taught you, okay? So he says, just as you partially did understand us, understand what? That we are your reason to be proud, as you also are ours in the day of our Lord Jesus, So the reason I believe, uh, or at least I lean towards the idea that Paul wants him to understand until the end is referring to the end of life or the revelation of Jesus Christ is here. That he's saying, look, you partially did understand and here's what you partially understood. We are your reason to be proud. We are your reason for boasting. Just as you are our reason for boasting. Paul had told him in 1 Corinthians that, hey, I brag about you to people. And he's saying that, you know, we're your reason to boast to others. And he says the real, uh, the real boasting is going to take place in the future, in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul, I'm assuming by what he's saying here, is that in the day he stands before the Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to beam with pride over all of the converts that God allowed him to participate in making. And all of those converts will be able to look at Paul and and beam with pride that he is their spiritual father. So that's what Paul is trying to remind them of there. And that is, yeah, the mutual reasons for pride in their future. All right. So we go on. And the second point is uh, Paul offers the defense of his changed plans. He's explaining change plans. Now he's defending his change plans. And he presents to them, reminds them of his original plan. He says in verse 15, In this confidence I intended at first to come to you so that you might twice receive a blessing. That is to pass your, uh, pass your way into Macedonia and again from Macedonia to come to you and by you to be helped on my journey to Judea. All right. So let's, uh, let's look at this. He had plan A, we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Plan A was for him to, he was in Ephesus at the time of the writing of 1 Corinthians, right? His plan was to leave Ephesus, go to Macedonia, and from Macedonia to go to Corinth, and from Corinth to Jerusalem. Well, the report that he had received was so disturbing that instead he went to plan B. We find it here in 2 Corinthians, at least part of it, and that is that he went directly from Ephesus to Corinth instead of Macedonia. Then he went from Corinth to Macedonia and ministered there and then returned, uh, or, or he desired to return to Corinth and then to go to Judea, definitely from, from Corinth. Well, 
What actually happened, and this is fun, isn't it? What actually happened is that he left Ephesus and went directly to Corinth, which is what he refers to here uh, eventually in 2 Corinthians as his painful visit. That's where he went to Corinth and was not received well, and apparently belittled and, and uh, uh, brought to taken to task in front of the congregation. He calls that his painful visit. And then from Corinth, he went back to Ephesus, which he was greeted with a riot because of his preaching. No wonder he wanted to go to heaven. Then he went from Ephesus to Troas, where he was looking for Titus and was so distraught, he could not find Titus. He was just beside himself, he says, and could not find Titus. And so then he went on to Macedonia and finally uh, uh, wound up, well, in Macedonia actually is where he's writing 2 Corinthians. So you can see why some people who did not trust Paul would, would say, you know, Paul's duplicitous. He says one thing and he does another. You can't trust the man, right? But Paul's going to go on in chapter two and he's uh, beginning at the end of chapter one, but in, on into chapter two and explain why it was he changed his plan and it was for their benefit. It was for their benefit that he changed his plans. All right, so Paul says, gives them the original plan and he says part of that original plan was so that you would receive, uh, uh, twice receive a blessing. Now, we need to be careful with this, with this passage. This is one of those passages that some might try to take out of context and say, see, you, get, you, get, you can get a second blessing of the Spirit. Well, that's not at all what Paul means here. Can anybody tell me why Paul, how, how we know Paul doesn't mean that? It's one word. Starts with a C. Context, thank you, because he explains what he means in the next verse, right? He says, in this uh, confidence, I intended at first to come to you so that you might twice receive a blessing. That is, in other words, what do I mean by twice receive a blessing? That is to pass your way into Macedonia and again from Macedonia to come to you and by you be helped on my journey. In other words, he wanted to come to them twice. And he's saying, look, if I had come, uh, the intention was to come to you twice and you would receive a blessing twice. Now, Paul would also uh, say that he was going to receive a blessing twice too if the visit went well, but that's what he's referring to. However, plans change and that did not happen. So he moves into the defense of his integrity in verses 17 through 22. Now, in verse 17, he gives us two rhetorical questions, both of them beginning with a Greek negative that expects a negative answer. In other words, Paul says, therefore, I was not vacillating when I intended to do this, was I? Or what I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh so that with me there it will be yes, yes, and no, no at the same time? And it's both of these Questions are formed grammatically to expect or to promote or provoke a negative answer. In other words, no, Paul, you were not uh, vacillating when you intended to do this. And no, Paul, you weren't making plans according to human flesh so that you were saying one thing and, and doing another or you had a duplicitous plan in the first place so that you could say one thing and mean another. No, no. That's not Paul. His character, his, his ministry in, in their lives would teach against that, would, would, would uh, um, testify against that. Paul wasn't like that. And so he points to God's faithfulness as the basis of his faithfulness. But... Okay, so he's going to compare God's faithfulness with his own. He says, but as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. This, is, this may be kind of Paul, not, I don't want to say taking an oath, but kind of calling God to witness against him in a sense. Um, because he's saying, look, just as God, you, you would never say God is duplicitous, you would never say that God says one thing and means another. You would never say you have to read between the lines of God's word. And just as you don't, just as you can take God as faithful, 
our word to you is faithful. It's not yes and no. It's not saying one thing and meaning another. It's not that you have to read between the lines to get the true meaning. For an explanation he's going to give in verse 19. For the Son of God, Christ Jesus, who was preached among you by us, me and Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but is yes in him. So Jesus Christ himself is the demonstration of God's faithfulness. And Paul says, that's the message we brought to you, the message concerning Jesus Christ. So we didn't do anything else. So whatever we wrote to you and whatever we taught you, taught you is, found in, is founded in the faithfulness of God, Jesus Christ being the ultimate testimony of God's faithfulness. So for the Son of God, Christ Jesus, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but is yes in him. For as many as are the promises of God, in him they are yes. Now again, struggled to understand what this meant. But he's saying, look, God is faithful. He's made promises. And Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all of those promises except the ones that are yet to be fulfilled. But he is like the stamp of, of guarantee that those promises will be fulfilled. So for as many as are the promises of God in him, in Christ Jesus, they are yes. In other words, they're, they're going to be fulfilled. And Christ came and demonstrated the faithfulness of God. Therefore, also through him is our amen to the glory of God through us. Now, what is he saying here? Well, if we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 16, remember Paul is dealing with those who speak in tongues. Well, you know, if, if all the church speaks in tongues or if someone is prophesying in tongues and there are people there, there's no, uh, no one there to translate and, and some people are, are not gifted in that area, he says, how will they offer their amen? But this was a customary practice when agreeing with or attesting to the truthfulness that of something that had been said or something that had been prayed, they would offer as a congregation an amen. And he says, therefore, also through him is our amen. In other words, we look at Jesus Christ and we say amen to God because he fulfills his promises. And it is our amen to the glory of God through us. So when someone says amen in church, it's bringing glory. I don't know if that's true or not. But it. So in verse 21 then, Paul goes on. He says, now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God, who also sealed us and gave us the spirit in our hearts as a pledge. So God's faithful work in us and in particular in this context, in Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, and even the Corinthian church, believe it or not, we see that God's faithful work produces stability or assurance. And what we find here, it's, it's interesting how we, we can find these great theological concepts throughout Scripture, but they never have those helpful Theological labels that the theologians give them, like Christology or theology or pneumatology, you know. Uh, and here we have the doctrine of the Trinity being presented to us it, right in front of our faces. And I bet if you were like me, on the first two or three read throughs of this passage, it, you did, it didn't even register, right? Finally, it registered. And I have to say it registered because somebody pointed it out to me in one of, the, one of the commentaries I was going back and consulting. And I may have missed it had it not been for that. So I could say there but for the grace of God, I would have missed this great truth that Paul points out here. And he presents to us the triune God and the, the work of the triune God in the life of the believer. Look at what he says, verse 21. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God. All right, so we have God the Father, God the Son presented to us right there. What are they, what's, what's going on in this? Well, it says that God confirms us 
in Christ. So our position, again, there is our position. And, and I'm convinced more and more all the time that you and I need to drink in. We need to chew up and eat up everything we can find about our position in Christ to help us through our everyday lives. And the more I find out, the more I realize I don't know much about my position in Christ. Because I'm not holy in myself. You're not holy in yourself, but I am holy in Christ. I'm not right with God in myself. You're not right with God in yourself, but we are right with God in Christ, right? I'm a sinner in myself. You're a sinner in yourself, but in Christ, we're holy, righteous, and just before God, okay? So he said, God confirms us in Christ. And that Greek word for confirm here, it is said that it is used in, in an ancient legal sense in that it is a guarantee of the validity of something. So in other words, God is in the process, and this is in the present tense, God is in a, the process of confirming us in Christ. As Murray Harris said in his commentary, God's continuous strengthening of believers in their faith in Christ and his progressive enriching of their knowledge of Christ is what Paul is speaking of here. Now, that is an ongoing process. The issue then is, are we cooperating in that process? Are we yielding to the spirit in that process and letting God have his way in us to continually establish and, and confirm us to, to grow us in Christ? And unfortunately, because we're human, it kind of happens in fits and starts sometimes, does it not? We can go through great periods of spiritual growth and then trip up somewhere for some reason or whatever, take our eyes off the goal for a moment and stall in that place. The good thing is, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we're never more than a prayer away of being reestablished in that process of spiritual growth. Well, Paul says the one who confirms us or guarantees the validity of our purchase in Christ is God the Father. So we can have assurance that although we may struggle now and, and have those fits and starts of spiritual growth, we're the, we've been purchased it's guaranteed, okay? And it's in Christ. Secondly, he said he anoints us. Christ, the word Christ, it's, it's a reference to Messiah. It's the Greek word for Messiah. Messiah meaning the anointed one. And he anoints us just as he anointed Christ at the beginning of his ministry. Luke 3, 21, 22, uh, Luke 4, 17 through 21 reveal Jesus Christ being anointed by the Spirit at the outset of his ministry. It's at his, his baptism. And then in Luke, in chapter 4, he goes to the synagogue and he reads from Isaiah. And he said, the Spirit of God has come upon me, referring to the anointing of the Spirit. Well, guess what? According to 1 John, chapter 2, you and I also have that anointing. In uh, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 20, John says, But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. Now, obviously, John was writing to a particular audience, but the same is said for us. It extends to us. We have an anointing uh, uh, by God. And that anointing took place at the moment we believed, and the Holy Spirit was given to us as a permanent residence within us. So we have been anointed by God, and it is God who anointed us through the Holy Spirit. Not only does he anoint us, he seals us. We see that in Ephesians 1.13 when he says that the Spirit has sealed us. Now, in, in the ancient times, uh, on a document, and this is the way it's used in the New Testament, a document would be sealed with with probably with the, the melted wax and an official seal. But what that did was it identified both the document and indicated who its owner was. And the owner being the one who would protect the document. 
Okay? So he has sealed us. In other words, his stamp of ownership is on us. And we are protected by him. Do we lose our salvation? No, we don't. We don't lose salvation. Can we fall into heinous, prolonged sin as a Christian? Yes, we can. When we do that, do we lose our salvation? No, we don't because we're sealed. Now, God will discipline us. He may even go so far as to cut our life short as we found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But we never lose being a son of the living God. How is it when Jesus Christ says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him has You realize that's in the present tense, has eternal life. He will not perish, but he has eternal life. So at the moment of salvation, you have at that moment, right now as you're sitting here, you have eternal life. If that eternal life is taken away, it's not eternal life. Thank you. It's not. It doesn't make any sense. So that's why some have to come along with a doctrine of the uh, perseverance of the saints and say, well, you were never saved in the first place. Well, thank you, judge, jury, and executioner. I appreciate that. Finally, Paul says that God gives the spirit as earnest. Everyone who's ever bought a house knows what earnest money is. Uh, Here it says it's, the word is translated as a pledge but it means an, as, a, as a deposit. It's our down payment. The Spirit is our down payment of those heavenly blessings that are awaiting us. Ephesians 1, we have been blessed with, with every blessing, uh, every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, right? And he is the down payment of all that. And so Paul rests his case here. Actually, he doesn't. He's just starting. But for today, he's resting his case on what God has done, not only in him and Silvanus and Timothy, but what he has done for the church in Corinth. And he's, it, this is one of those things that demonstrates for that church the unity of the body of Christ. We've all experienced that same thing that Paul and Silvanus and Timothy and the church of Corinth have experienced. And it brings us into unity because we've all been given the spirit. We've all been anointed by God, by the spirit. We've all been sealed by God, had his stamp of approval placed on us. You ever go to uh, one of those, you know, I can't even, like the Kiwanis Club or something like that. Or, or even in, uh, I remember in... Uh, High school, all the FHA people, they would, everybody would have their jacket or here, even better. And forgive me, FHA people, but uh, our basketball team, we all had those letter jackets on, right? Right. And mine had a lot of patches and stuff. (laughs) Glory days, how they pass you by. But anyway, but it identified us together, right? As a unit, as a team. And although we can't see that stamp that God, that seal that God has placed upon us. He sees it. I'm convinced that Satan probably sees it too. And it it identifies us as one, one group. And so Paul says, look, what God has done for us, he has done for you. You, you're, You're wanting to accuse us or accuse me, Paul, of being duplicitous of saying one thing or writing one thing and meaning something else because I've had to change my plans. He says, my conduct in the past with you speaks for itself that we conducted ourselves not by worldly or merely man's wisdom, but by the grace or in the grace of God that we conducted ourselves in, in sincerity or in purity of motives Our conscience is clear, and that's why, he says, based upon our actions among you. So now he's going to move in, hopefully next week, Lord willing, we get to this point next week, he's going to explain why he didn't come. You guys are wanting to complain about me having to change my plans. Let me tell you why I changed my plans, and it was for your benefit. And so he's going to get into that next week. But Paul had the testimony of a clear conscience. 
Clear conscience is a great thing. And the only way for us to have a clear conscience is to live in holiness and righteousness and truth. And when we do stub our toe and say that word or whatever might take us out of that immediate fellowship with God, we're still sealed. We're still guaranteed to the end. And we have the promise of, uh, of returning to that fellowship simply by one prayer, that if we confess our sins. So the, the way to deal with a, a guilty conscience is to take it to the Lord and forsake your sin, right? So if you're dealing with that today, there's your, I, I think that's, that's your recipe for success. Keep a short, I, I was listening to Andy, Andy Woods teach uh, a little while back and he was talking about keeping a short account with God. Don't let those sins pile up, but just <clears throat> as soon as, you, you, soon as you're, they're made, you're made aware of it, confess it to God. Keep that short account and that'll help keep your conscience clear. If you're here today and, and you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, the, the word of God tells us that uh, uh, there's some bad news for you and that bad news is that uh, you're separated from God by your sin and that separation, when you die physically, that spiritual separation is going to continue for eternity in a place called hell. But God was not satisfied to leave you or to leave us in that position. But he sent his only son, his only begotten son, as Jesus calls himself, to, be, to become a man, to live a perfect life, and to die a cruel death on a cross that paid the penalty for your sins and mine. And he says, if you will simply trust him, put your faith in him, you will be saved, your sins will be forgiven, and you will spend eternity in a place of eternal happiness and joy instead of a place of eternal torment and suffering. So if you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, I would plead with you to do that today because this is the only moment that you're guaranteed. Father, we thank you for your word. Pray, Father, that you would help us to live in holiness and righteousness and purity of motive and uh, sincerity. Lord, help us to represent you well. Uh, and Lord, help us to learn the lessons that Paul has taught here today. Help us to, uh, it's, it's an amazing thing to me, Lord, that Paul could actually, with a straight face, stand up and say, follow my example. Because we know, Lord, because he lived a life of, of, uh, of a great witness, a great testimony. He could say that. Lord, I pray that each one of us would be able, at some point in our lives, to stand up and tell someone, follow my example. Not that I would ever do that, Lord, but I would like to think that someday I would be so Christ-like that, that I could have someone follow my example, Lord. I pray that for all of us. And as we leave this place, Lord, give us your heart for the lost. Help us to, to be moved by those who we know, uh, if they were to die, uh, would meet you not at the Bema judgment, but at the great white throne judgment and spend eternity in hell. Help us to come to that realization and really understand it and allow that to move us to action. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand.